Hi, I'm going to explain Nazi Germany and the rise of Nazism in Germany by telling you the story of two special education teachers in California. So on this block, um, almost all these houses are a million dollars each. Most, some, are, some are actually more. And I believe there is one house that we'll talk about later that's closer to two million dollars. And as you can see, they're nothing special. The houses themselves are quite ordinary. Uh, this one's nice. It's got a Japanese garden set up, looks like. But as you can see, they're not mansions. <clears throat> if you wanted to buy the same home in a uh, state like Nebraska, Omaha, uh, you would pay perhaps $100,000 or maybe at, you know $175,000 at the most. And so, <clears throat> why are these houses so expensive? Well, the answer is tax policy. When you buy a house, you're taking advantage of multiple levels of subsidies, of, which are the consequence of tax policy. Uh, in, in this case, the mortgage interest tax deduction. And so when you buy a house, you get access to leverage. So in other words, you make $100,000 a year combined income, husband makes $50,000 a year, wife makes $50,000 a year. You can borrow and buy a house that's, you know, much more, half a million dollars, sometimes even more, depending on how much down payment you can put down. Now, so you've got leverage. On top of that, you've got, again, a tax policy that costs the government hundreds of billions of dollars a year uh, in lost potential revenue. And people say, this is fine. You know, there's not a problem because we want a society of homeowners. We want people to have a vested stake in their communities. And that's what we have here. Uh, you know, obviously that's, uh, it's, it's worked, but it hasn't worked for everybody, but we'll get to that later. Um, the houses on this side are a little bit nicer. There are some homes that look like they could be worth, you know, that they deserve to be worth a million dollars. That's because the homeowners have, you know, added their own special touches, not because of the property itself. Here is a remodeled property. Looks very nice. So you see that ultimately the reason these houses are so valuable uh, has nothing to, nothing to do with the inherent value, but a combination of leverage and tax policy. Now, let's talk about the teachers. Within the state of California, my neighbors, um, we'll just talk about my neighbors. We'll start with that. Here's another, speaking of teachers, you can see that little uh, pencil right there. And then there's a little art. I think there's a bit, yeah, there we go. There's kind of an art display over here that you can't quite see, but it's uh, right there. So, teachers, uh, my neighbors, happen to, happen to be uh, special education uh, teachers. And if you want to talk about uh, the best neighbors anyone, anyone, anyone can have, it would be these two individuals. Uh, extremely intelligent, um, good people. Uh, you know, the kind of people that when they retire, travel together, hold hands together when they walk uh, down the street on a daily outing and ultimately the uh we want to talk about you know why this blameless group of people are actually the result of a backlash has have caused a backlash that has led to our current political climate not just in california but nationwide where we as americans in 2020 uh, will be voting for one of two people in the national elections uh, one would be Joe Biden, who has been in Congress and in the government for many decades, has pretty much gone with the tide on every major issue, uh, whether it's crime prevention, jails, uh, jail funding, um, or most infamously, voting for the war in Iraq. Always seems to have gone with the tide. And he's being rewarded for it. He ran for president before, a few decades ago, 
and uh, was disqualified himself simply because of a, uh, today it's quite funny, but it was plagiarism. And it wasn't something that was, you know, egregious. Um, but he, dis he, was, he disqualified himself on that basis, which again, today, with all the pol political shenanigans going on, uh, is, you know, it harkens back to a time when Americans were more naive, and they really did believe that politicians had to have a higher moral status than the average person, uh, simply because of the power that they controlled or were in charge of managing. And so that's who we, who we have on the liberal side, on the progressive side. Um, and on the other side, we have somebody that many people consider to be uh, paving the way for a corporate state. Somebody who's going to lower regulations in order to provide an alternative, an affordable alternative <clears throat> to the inefficiency of government. And in doing so, is going to weaken the power of governments uh, and then transfer the revenue that would otherwise go to governments uh, to organizations that get things done. <clears throat> That's who's on the other side. And uh, people have called him a fascist. They've called him corrupt and so on. But the fact of the matter remains that he criticized Joe Biden's vote on Iraq. That's one of the reasons that he got elected is because he seems less willing to go with the tide. So now that we have a sufficient background, let's go ahead and talk about, let's get back to the special education teachers. And like I said, there's, if there's two groups of people, of individuals, uh, that would be, you know, blameless in any society, it would be individual farmers, small farmers, and special education teachers. And it turns out that special education teachers within the state of California cannot have their budget cut. The education budget, well, first of all, nobody, no politician wants to be in a position where they have an opponent accusing them of cutting funds for special education kids. But there's actually, as far, if I'm correct, a law that literally prevents the cutting of this line item in the budget. Um, and so we call that, in, in political terms, we call that a sacred cow. Um, I don't know where it comes from, probably, maybe it's got a Hindu connotation, I'm not sure. But never, nevertheless, you can see that we now have another element to add to the leverage in the tax policy. We have a stable income, because the budget cannot be cut, and therefore, for the most part, the jobs increase or are maintained within that sector. And in this case, remember, there's two special education teachers, or just two teachers, and they belong to the teachers' unions. Now, within the state of California, the largest item in the state budget is education overall. Not special education, that's a component of the overall education budget. And within the state of California, by law, Proposition 98, a minimum of 40% of the entire state operating fund must go to K through 12 education plus community colleges. And again, that's no politician wants to be accused of not caring about education. So that budget never gets cut. And in fact, there's a minimum funding guarantee. And consequently, within the state of California, we have a situation now where the funding for education has gone from 40% Remember, that's the minimum. It's gone from 40% all the way up to 50% in the state of California. That is, includes colleges as well, which have actually received less funding because of the way this, this funding guarantee operates. Uh, because again, K through 12 gets first crack at the state revenues. If the state revenues fluctuate, colleges get less, parents have to pay more for the kids to go to college. On top of that, remember the minimum funding guarantee provides stable income, not just for the individuals, but for the banks, for investors, and bondholders, bond issuers, and everyone else. So as a result of this stable funding guarantee, the teacher's pension fund, a retirement fund within the state of California, is now worth over $200 billion for one group of people. 
I don't know what percentage teachers in terms of employees make up in, this, in the entire state of California, but government employees are in general are about 20% of the state as well as, you know, about state as well as, you know, it's national. So we're dealing with a very, as you can see, with a very privileged group of people who themselves do not consider themselves to be privileged. And that's just that $200 billion more, about 231, is only for the teachers. There's another fund that's for other government employees that's actually worth more because of the higher number of employees. That pension fund is now worth over $300 billion. So you have about half a, half a trillion dollars, potentially more depending on stock market investments, within that go to the top 20% of employees within one state. And to be fair, California is a huge state uh, economically. Um, you know, I, I think that at one point, depending on the day, on the year, California, California's economy by itself ranks anywhere in the top, well, let's just say in the top 10, you know, between five and 10 in the whole world, just as one state. It's got technology companies here, uh, Oil and gas, Chevron is based in California, about two hours from here. And so it's got a diversified economy as well. It used to have a lot of defense spending in the South, in San Diego, a lot of naval bases down there. Not so much anymore, but again, that's defense spending as well, which probably leveraged itself into technology spending, which then went into things like, you know, um, Google, Facebook, and so on, Apple. Now, we can see right away, hopefully by now, we've got leverage, we've got debt, we have stable incomes, and then we have political power. Because you can't really cut these things anymore, whether by law or whether, well, by law, which sometimes establishes a minimum funding guarantee, which is essentially a do not cut policy that is then leveraged by the banking system in order to provide special benefits. Now, in this case, the pension fund assumes that it will earn about 7% a year. It used to be around 8%, they lowered it, <laughs> but about 7% a year. If you do the math, that means that every, you know, if you, if you assume about half a trillion dollars uh, in these pension funds at a 7% annual assumption of return, what that's saying is every 10 years, the government and the banks have to magically come up with another half a trillion dollars because they're paying out money every year, presumably. And you know, a lot of these are based on actuarial assumptions, which may be true, which may not be true. In this case, because it's a little bit more complicated because a lot of teachers are women and so they live longer than men. So <laughs> that may be one of the reasons why it's a 7% return to make sure there's enough funding involved. But nevertheless, Everyone has to come up with, in one state, half a trillion dollars in stock market returns, or just in, in, in investment returns, every 10 years. So we see that the two special education teachers across, you know, on my block, who are the best neighbors anyone could have, you can see that they also happen to own the most expensive house. Part of that is just um, intelligence. Part of that is, is wise investments, but also the the husband is a very good handyman. He's just, he's a, he just has a science background. Uh, he, so he's, he knows how to work around the house. But nevertheless, they have the most expensive house on the block. We can see that it's not an accident. It's a combination of many, many different things, of deliberate policy choices. And then, you know, you can't really get more deserving people. I think that's the, that's, that's the upside of all this, right? You can't get more deserving people than these two individuals. Now, they're the ones that say hi to their neighbors whenever somebody moves in. I think we have, we have some new neighbors. I haven't even said hello yet. Uh, they're the ones who greet people and so on. Now, what does this have to do with Nazism? Well, it turns out that the, having access to $200 billion a year at a minimum funding guarantee provides, confers political power. 
And so, as a result, California is now a one-party state. A liberal, one-party, progressive, one-party state. One party controls every government office from the top to the down, uh, all the way down. And this is not an accident, unless you can come up with half a $200 billion in assets, a minimum funding guarantee, and so on. You can imagine very quickly how this has resulted. Now, no one, no one says or no one thinks that education itself has gotten better. Oh, by the way, one of the cool things about California is all the immigrants, uh, especially from Mexico. So this, this guy's got a really cool car, got Day of the Dead. It's not something you see, uh, it's really cool. Um, hold on. So, um, Dio de los Muertos. It's really cool. It's a very, uh, I haven't been to Wakaka yet, but apparently that's the epicenter of the celebrations. Um, and so, let's get back to what we were talking about. So what you see is that now you have political power, which then creates, because it's such a large chunk and a stable chunk of the government's budget, minimum 40%, it becomes sort of a centralized base by which it's not a fist. It doesn't start out as a fist, right? It's an open hand. We want to help somebody. It becomes a fist. The potential to become a fist because of the fact that it's power and power corrupts. So we now have a situation where one party controls essentially the entire economy. It doesn't look that way, it doesn't feel that way, but remember, you've got a privileged 20% that control about 40%, well, no, minimum 40%, of the entire budget. That's tens of billions of dollars a year. In order to displace these people, you would have to come up with a, I mean, equivalent money, right? I mean, otherwise, if you try to lay off that, 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 those people or you suddenly try to cut pensions, you can imagine the political backlash that would occur, despite the fact that we're talking about the top 20% of society. And how did this happen? How is it that we, you know, if I go online every year since I was growing up, no matter what happens, you see a, an article online about how these young teachers have to spend money out of pocket to create their own classrooms. And I call shenanigans on this because even though it's true, the fact of the matter is that there's plenty of money in the budget in order to avoid this. And so you see that when you control that amount of money, what ends up happening is if the compensation system becomes back-ended, it favors older people, it favors people who are tenured, who are locked into the system, the stable system. And as a result, it starts to shortchange people who are coming in, simply because the terms are not broadly applicable or sustainable the more people come into this privileged class of society. Remember, you're already trying to come up with, for this one group of people, uh, you know, you're already trying to come up with hundreds of billions of dollars every 10 years. Within a system that, again, no one thinks is improving wisdom or democracy or, de or voting, or, you know, the, the, the potential for a better voting system or a better voter education, no one thinks any of this at all. And in fact, you know, if you look at the private sector, you know, a lot of those people are not at all uh, are more diverse, right? If you go into Google, it's like looking at the, at the United Nations. Well, it turns out that the teachers within the state of California, again, a majority, overwhelmingly female, uh, last time I checked about 70%, and overwhelming, overwhelmingly Caucasian. Which again, makes sense because they were there first, uh, before a lot, of Im a lot of immigrants came in. And so you can see that the system is actually, within the state of California, the immigrants have come in to sustain this unsustainable system because we're separate and un un unequal. So within the state of California, when you talk about favoring immigration, well, it's not a choice. You have to do it. If you don't get all these workers coming in, these specialized engineers coming in, making six figures, you can't sustain this system that heavily favors existing groups within the state of California. 
So it's not an accident. It's not something that's charitable. It's a necessity. But no one sees it that way. So every year, there is this propaganda, this marketing that comes out and talks about how poor teachers, or how poor teachers are and how hard they work. Despite the fact that within the state of California, teachers are, by law, only required to work half the year. So basically, that, that's because a large chunk is summer, summer school. Um, sorry, <laughs> summer break. And so once you're tenured, you get three months off in the summer, you include things like holidays, like two weeks off in Christmas, all the weekends. And again, what happens, you're only working about half a year while the private sector, because it's constantly trying to sustain this unsustainable system, has to work more. So I remember growing up that I kind of assumed that I would only work about five, six days a week. Well, with technology and emails and the private sector, it's now within this expensive community. It's now assumed that if you want to live in a place like this, that you're going to work seven, you're going to check emails and be available seven days a week. And so you see that's not an accident either. That's a necessity. Preserve the system. So why is it that we get these news stories, quote, that talk about the poverty of this privileged 20%? It's because it's marketing. When you have that much money, you have the ability to buy advertising dollars and to control the narrative and to make what's untrue into the prevailing truth by highlighting outliers. And so again, it's not an accident. Absolute power corrupts because it, it's, it also manages not only to control the economy, but it also manages to control the media. Not control, but create a system where they, the narrative is controlled. And so as a re result of my opinions, there's always backlash, you know, um, a ton of backlash against me online, um, elsewhere, and so on. And I, I've actually well volunteered in public schools, not the ones that, the newer ones. Never had any complaints. My mother's a teacher in a private school. So again, we're, we're still within the education system, but in a separate sphere. <sighs> but nevertheless, we got backlash. Well, I get backlash. So you see that as a result of this, we can see all the elements in place. The backlash occurs in order to preserve the funding mechanism and the narrative. And so suddenly, and it all makes sense by the way, you can't, you know, everyone who rises to the top is almost always part of the establishment. It doesn't matter if you're the founder of Pakistan, who was a lawyer, Gandhi, who was a lawyer, um, again, somebody privileged. In almost every case, by the way, that's why people like Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali are so genuine, are so captivating, because they're not privileged. There's an authenticity about them that cannot be denied, precisely because of their background. And not to mention the fact that they were able to more accurately gauge better than land, better than all these government government funded institutions, the needle on things like the Vietnam War. Now, hopefully by now, right, we're getting a better sort of piece, right? We've got leverage, stable income, tax policy, essentially the law plus the banking system that creates a stable funding mechanism that then gets converted into political power that then creates a narrative in order to maintain this, this political power, this structure for the top 10% or the top 20%. And at some point, right, requires a separate system, whether through immigration or otherwise, or just through financial chicanery, which is where you got 2007, 2008, and we now have more debt than we do, than the United States had in 2007, 2008, because it's all unsustainable. What I'm talking about is unsustainable. 
And so suddenly you have clashes. People in the private sector suddenly are only able to exist in the system as cooperative participants through a lack of knowledge. In other words, if they understood this, they would be against it, this disparate treatment. And so more money has to be spent highlighting outliers. So suddenly within the state of California, we have a um, vice presidential nominee for the quote unquote liberals, uh, who is half Indian, half black, who went to a historically black college and who is so inauthentic. It's weeks of desperation every time she opens her mouth. It's, in other words, you have somebody that's been trained to do everything, all the way down to her fake eyelashes. So, you can see right away why so many people become attracted to a force of power that is not the establishment because it has authenticity. That, that can include things like rap music, and so on, but I don't want to get too much into the sociological aspects of all of this. We want to get to the big picture. So once again, you see that within one state, that all these things happen in order to maintain the status quo. All of them. And then instead of blaming things like the pension fund and so on, or the 7% rate of return that's, that's assumed, we end up blaming immigrants because remember, the necessity in order to maintain the system. You have to have somebody coming in and buying a million dollar home with a bank loan in order to justify the assumptions, the financial assumptions underlying everything from the assumed investment rate of return just to the idea that somebody can retire at some point, sell the house, the primary savings vehicle, and then move somewhere else, right? So somebody new has to come in and in order for somebody new to come in, they have to believe the unbelievable. So that's why you have the media coming in to convince you of the unbelievable and the unsustainable. And here we are. So the first thing you want to think about Nazi Germany, what were the Nazis? The Nazis were national socialists. They considered themselves to be an aggrieved party because of all the debt that Germany had to pay post-World War I and post-World War II, or just post-World War II, um, sorry, <laughs> post-World War I, and they consider themselves to be the victim of outside forces. By the way, Germany, of course, had to pay money, uh, reparations after World War II as well, uh, to the point where Germany didn't pay it off, pay off that debt until, I believe, you know, from 19, so they lost in 1945, uh, I believe they didn't pay it off until 1990, um, in any case. So you have people in power who are actually privileged, who somehow control the narrative and then end up blaming the outliers for their problems. The outliers exist simply because you, they, had to, they had to come in to create a propaganda effect, a marketing effect, to sustain the unsustainable. So. Since you have a pension fund that then leads to political power in the state of California, what ends up happening is that in order to cover up the fact or to mislead people or to distract people from the racial homogenousness of that political structure, the foundation of that political structure, you have to start appointing people that have color. On the national level, the local level, in fact, Kamala Harris, who's the vice presidential nominee, is from California. She's representing, representing California. Again, not an accident. You have to start becoming increasingly focused on outliers to keep distracting people. And in almost every case, there's a battle, seemingly, between increasingly more extreme outliers, which then creates, trickles its way from the edges into the center, corrupting the entire spectrum. So on the one hand, you have people that are creating these outliers in order to maintain the unsustainable, to distract you from what's really, from the really homogenous nature of the established system. 
And then on the other hand, you have people that are sincere. They, they, you know, you can see how this works because people are sincere. You know, if you're a good person, you want a system that is diverse. So why not promote people to the top who are diverse? And so all these things, right, create a backlash within the general population. There's a backlash against immigration because people were chosen. Someone like, say, Kamala Harris um, is inauthentic and is in a position where <laughs> clearly not somebody that is, I wouldn't say relatable. Um, she probably is relatable. She's a very successful woman. But not, not authentic because she's been boosted by these same forces that are trying to maintain the status quo. And so when she runs into somebody authentic, such as the debates against Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii, she's destroyed. She gets destroyed by anybody who's, not, who's authentic. The reason the politicians seem to do so well is because they're constantly on a stage with other inauthentic people that are trying to maintain this structure. And again, it's no accident that on the national level, Joe Biden is Catholic. This whole city with the million dollar homes, um, well, this block, this whole neighborhood. Uh, we were in San Jose, Catholic mayor. He, won and he got into office by defeating somebody from the same Catholic high school that he went to. They both went to the same Catholic high school. San Jose police chief went to St. Francis High School, a Catholic high school. Um, gosh, I mean, presiding judge of the county courthouse that has jurisdiction over this neighborhood. Uh, went to a law school at Santa Clara University, which is a Catholic university, private. Uh, the governor is Catholic. Um, I mean, you just go down the line. And yet, none of them are vice presidential candidates, right? Odd. Oh, the Board of Supervisors for the county. Uh, majority Catholic. Absolute power. Under the guise of progress and progressivism. An open hand that becomes a fist. Because in order to maintain the unsustainable, you have to crush the stent. What that does in an era where anybody can have a blog or a YouTube video, where the costs of media are less onerous. What that does is it fragments society. It gets the extreme into the middle and corrupts the whole thing, as we just talked about. And so, my two neighbors, who are the best people on the whole block, they remind me of Nazis. Because remember, they're both members of the teachers union, the underlying basis of this absolute power within the state. They would never think of, the, of themselves as Nazis. In fact, the wife is married, is a, she's a Caucasian woman from uh, Illinois, presumably Christian. Uh, she's married to somebody, a male who's Jewish. So this analogy doesn't quite work, does it? Until you realize that it was the maintenance of power that is key to look at when you're studying history and war and the attempts to hold on to that power. So once you realize that Nazi Germany came into power because of absolute power and its desire for absolute power, you can also see how there was, they can't get there unless it elevates and gets on its side a group of deluded, brainwashed, group of good citizens who don't consider, consider themselves to be part of the problem. And in fact, on an, indi on an individual level, there's not part of the problem. They are, again, the best neighbors anyone could have. And yet, <laughs> you can see they're also members of a group of financially powerful people or sorry, may have financially powerful people that have caused political homogenousness 
and the load to absolute power, which then, of course, crushes the stem in the way we just talked about. And then also causes a backlash because it has to highlight outliers, which then causes a backlash within the non-outlier population that gets fed up with its inauthentic inau inauthenticity. Then, which then breaks down social cohesion. And it starts because that neighbor, the one that anybody would want to have, says nothing and is actually a member of that group. And it's not a coincidence that they're a member of that group. They're handsomely rewarded for being a member of that group. They have the most, they have the most expensive house on the block. That's the mechanism you want to look at. That nastyism is actually a lesson against absolute power. And it's a lesson that the best neighbors you could possibly have are co-opted within that system without themselves knowing it or thinking of themselves as part of the problem. And that requires, again, we'll say control of the media, control of the narrative. And that's the only way you get the best people on the block the best neighbors you could possibly have, creating a situation that leads to absolute power while themselves never considering, them, considering themselves to be equivalent to the situation that happened in Germany. Now, remember I said that there were, I said there's two groups of people that were blameless, right, in society. Uh, individual farmers and special education teachers. Well, it turns out that the presidential elections in this country happen in at least the primaries where you get to select the presidential nominees. Happen in a state of Iowa. That's where they basically get to select because they're the first ones that have these primaries, this election process for the, for the nominees on the national level. They get to dictate who, who makes it and, and, who, and who represents all of us. It's a tiny little, tiny little state with a very small population. I don't, even, I don't even think they have five. Let's say they have 10 million people. I don't, I don't think they have that many. So the state is almost all, I'd say 80, 90% white. They have been the ones to dictate the national system. So you see how absolute power, you see why society sort of degrades and devolves, right? Into issues of race and so on, because especially in America where you've had segregation, active policies and laws to promote segregation. <sighs> because there are overlaps. But rather than fix the underlying issues, we tend to focus on the most visible characteristics that we see, which are, of course, not finance, <laughs> not banking, and not power. So we repeat the same cycles of history because we look at the Nazis and we say, we could never be like them. Or if you're a white woman, who's the best neighbor anybody could have, who's married to a Jewish man, would never consider herself a Nazi. Because you can't do a direct transposition, you don't consider yourself as similar to anyone else in history, which then leaves you open to falling in, into the same pattern and the same trap. And so, with the farmers, I kind of lied to you. Right, with all Iowa happens to receive a ton of subsidy subsidies for farming and agriculture, corn, ethanol, now soybeans, and so on. They receive the most benefits, probably per capita, than any other state. So remember, remember what we talked about tax policy, which then leads to a stable income, which then leads to consolidation and absolute power, the open hand becoming a fist. Well, Iowa probably doesn't have that many, I haven't checked, but they probably don't have that many individual farmers anymore because of all these tax policies that were done in good faith, the same way that the special education funding budget can't be cut. Well, you can imagine if you have that kind of guaranteed income that bigger players will come in. And that's what happens, that's what's, what's going on in Iowa which again is a completely homogenous state. I don't think, oh, I think one county voted uh, unlike the other county, or, or everywhere else in the state. Just one, the college town, just out of the whole state. So you see that the pre most people, the people who are most blameless are actually the ones that we, that help us dig our own graves because they become the beneficiaries of tax policies that are unsustainable and discriminatory. 
So I lied because it turns out that, well, first of all, there aren't that many individual farmers anymore. But second of all, um, you know, when we talk about farmers, we're talking about a, con a conglomerate now that is a beneficiary of tax pol favorable tax policy in the same way that the special education system creates a foundation for absolute power. Be <laughs> it's the good guys that kill us in the end. And they don't see themselves as the bad guys because they're benefiting and they're good people. They're genuinely good people. So you see that the same thing happened in Germany. And not, not the exact same way, but the same thing in terms of absolute power. This idea of locking into a system of grievances that actually represents the establishment that then requires projection against others in order to maintain this discriminatory system, which of course relies on propaganda and so on. And I keep trying to explain to people, you know, Germany had to have been an open society before Hitler because you know, it had so many uh, Jewish people there. You can't be an open, I mean, you wouldn't have had so many Jews to kill, to murder, had you not been an open society before Hitler. So once again, you have a similar pattern where I, an immigrant, I'm across the street or on the same block as very nice people who fit the same pattern as Nazi Germany. So why do we have this weird political system in, in Europe that divides power and requires compromise? It's precisely so that we don't end up with absolute power. So the European political system is specifically designed to have these, the system that's very strange to Americans, where you divide power, you slice it up in, in as many ways as you possibly can to force compromises. And so it's not unusual to have, you know, 10%, 20%, 30%, and they all have to, you know, and so on, and they all have to work together, depending on the number of seats that are up, up for election. That's standard, standard in Europe, precisely because they learned from history. And then, as an American, I used to look at that and say, this is crazy, you can't get anything, you can't get anything done. It doesn't make any sense. And now I realize why they did it, to prevent the situation that I'm in today, here in the state of California, a one-party state bordering on a, on a theocracy within government that is on its foundation financially unsustainable, and yet in the top 10 economies worldwide, which of course gives rise to massive debt, which is what really upholds the entire foundation of what we just talked about. Why don't I leave? Well, that's another lesson for you for Germany. Uh, I've got parents that want to stay here. Like, even though I see, you know, we had internment camps for the Japanese here, concentration camps. Well, shouldn't call them concentration camps, but they had camps where the Japanese were forced, forcibly, you know, de deported to within the state of California in Manzanar. And as an immigrant, I think there's at least a 20% chance that my whole family could, regardless of who's coming into the next election, be put into camps. Um, at least 20%, and there's nothing I can do. I can't take them out. My parents are stubborn, they're old, they wanna stay here. Uh, and if one day they get a little letter that says, report to so-and-so facility, they'll probably do it. And all this time I've been telling them, let's move, let's take advantage of the high values and leave. They won't do it. And so I can see again that we're all victims of our circumstances, even if we're right, even if we think we have access to um, the future. We're, we're all swept up in the tide that carries all of us together, which is why we ought to care more about what carries us together, about the tides that come into our lives. Because it's the good people that will, in the end, kill you.